brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, people, coming at you from sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and while it's fun to talk about space demons, reptilian elite, and secret underground cities, the most important thing we can talk about is truly getting at the heart of health and wellness. Because we know that our water is in piss-poor shape, chemicals and heavy metals are being sprayed in the air, and our land has been thoroughly trashed by one giant dirty industrial process after another. Yet the international conversation seems focused on climate change, while few are talking about making our environment less toxic. Nearly every autoimmune condition, neurological issue, and debilitating illness is on the rise, and even our current news cycle is centered around the spread of the oh-so-deadly coronavirus. But what if germ theory itself, the notion of infectious disease, viruses, and bacteria being the root cause of our problems, was fundamentally flawed? and at best is based on more guesses and faith-based doctrine than the Big Bang, and at worst is a vast conspiracy to find an invisible scapegoat as well as drain our bodies and our bank accounts. Well, sometimes it's best to go back to the basics, and according to today's guests Don Lester and David Parker, germ theory itself, the scientific basis that our entire medical system is based upon, has never been proven. It's the subject of their massive, nearly 800-page book, What Really Makes You Ill, Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong, and I'm psyched to get into it. The infectious disease doubters and medical system slayers, Don and David, welcome to the higher side. (laughs) Hi, Greg. Thank you very much for inviting us on, and we've been really looking forward to talking to you about this. Oh, absolutely. It is a real pleasure. Your book is massive and full of interesting facts and history that really do make me start to wonder about these things that we've taken for granted as to why we get sick. And you really do go back to the beginnings of medical history. It is quite a trip. And in previous episodes, we've talked about how toxic our environment is plenty of times, as well as the suppression and demonization of many cures that have popped up more from the natural world than from Big Pharma. But to say germs and viruses have never been proven to cause disease is a much bolder claim. What was it that got you looking at the fundamentals so thoroughly? How long have you been doing this research? Well, as you say, it's a big book, 800 pages. And we've been researching this for, well, at least 10 years, over 10 years. So a lot of research has gone into this. And as you'll know from having a look at the book, there's 40 pages of references alone where we've looked at white papers and stuff put out by the WHO, World Health Authority, for those that are not sure what the abbreviations are. So yeah, it's a bit of an expose really of the whole medical establishment. Um, We have to be careful what we say because some of the big money behind it in the pharmaceutical companies and others have got huge vested interests and they don't take kindly to anyone criticizing what they do. But to answer your question more specifically as to how we sort of got into this, it was really from personal experiences with close family and friends over a period of time who were diagnosed with cancer 
various cancers and, and various age groups, the people, and they all, and I'm talking at this stage of six different people, who all took the normal medical treatments, whether it's chemotherapy or radiotherapy or combinations of the two. They all obeyed what the doctors said, they all followed it faithfully, and they all died. So I started to wonder what was going off there, particularly as I had another relative, an elderly lady, who was also diagnosed with cancer, but she was very adamant that she was not going to be messed around, as she put it, and she didn't want any of the chemo or radiotherapy. She just wanted to be left alone, and she'd just live with it. And the medical establishment still monitored her over the period of a year or two until they came to the decision that they were able to tell her that her cancer had completely gone. So that was really great news. So I was left wondering, well, what's going off here? I've got six people who followed the medical advice, taken the treatment, and they've all died. And one lady refused all of it, and she lived. So that was what really started me thinking. And, you know, Dawn and I, we've known one another for many years, and we talked about this and thought there's something very peculiar going on, something wrong, particularly when we'd heard the medical establishment, as they still do, crowing that their cancer research is getting better and better. And, you know, they have oh, a growing and at least a 50% success rate with curing cancer. Well, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, just for the six people that I know, you've had a 100% failure rate. So where does this 50% success rate come from? So it was that sort of thing that got us interesting to start to have a look and see just what was behind all this. And we found that the more we dug into it, the murkier it got, and the more we found that the things we were being told and had been brought up to believe by the medical establishment were untrue. Instead of it being a science, it became obvious to us it was more a belief system uh, that people and I'm talking about doctors now, we're just following a dogma. And we're not here saying that doctors are evil people and they're out to deceive the public, you know, far from it. I mean, the general medical staff, whether they're nurses or doctors, believe they're doing the right thing and they want the best for their patients. But like anyone, they can only do what they're taught. And if medical school, as we know, because we've talked to doctors, you know, they teach them certain things. And as we know, most of the medical schools are funded by or wholly owned by pharmaceutical companies or affiliates to pharmaceutical companies. So there's quite a bias there in the type of things that they're going to be taught. And basically, they taught that medicines are the answer to everything, that whatever the symptoms, they've got a name for it, and then they'll prescribe a particular drug or treatment. So. As we realized that this was quite a murky thing that we were looking at, we thought, well, where do we start with it? So we decided that we'd start at the beginning. We'd take nothing for granted. We'd both follow the true scientific method, which is follow the evidence. And we'll start with the most basic question of all is what really makes you ill? We knew that we were told by the establishment and still are that it's almost everything is due to germs of one sort or another, either viruses or bacteria. So we started to look for the proofs of whether this was true. And in a nutshell, we found that it wasn't true, that the whole thing is based on assumptions as much as anything, and that there's no true scientific, and I'm talking true scientific evidence, to support the germ theory. And I guess in a way, the clue is in the title, germ theory, i.e. it's a theory, it's not a proven fact. And that's really where we started. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want this to be a monologue, so you know, you're know, you welcome to jump in and ask some questions as we go along. Sure, sure. Yes, that tees us up quite well. And I agree with you. The cancer situation is quite dire. I think that's a huge conspiracy. Chemotherapy and radiation can't hold a candle to a proper diet and just an increase in nutrition and focusing on things that way. I mean, there's plenty of examples, the Gerson Institute, where basically they're healing cancer with green smoothies. And that's essentially 
what your book is about largely is getting away from the toxic environment and focusing on nutrition. And with cancer, I think that's, at least for this audience, fairly well established that there's something crazy going on there. But viruses and germ theory, I mean, this is way more fundamental. In the book, you say there are a number of sources that provide a corroboration of the assertion that germ theory lacks any original scientific proof. And this is probably the element of your positions that sounds most radical to the listeners. What sources do you find most convincing that people should know about? Well, the first thing you need to remember is that it's important that those who propose a theory are the ones who actually need to prove it. And it's not just for us to say, oh, it's not been proved. We look at the evidence and we see that their theories haven't been proved. A lot of the sources that we've used, I mean, we have quoted a number of medical doctors who were around at about a similar time to Louis Pasteur, who is the, well, he's given the credit for the germ theory, but he wasn't the first person who posited the idea that there were these small agents that invaded the body, infected people, and are the cause of disease. And these germs then started being looked for in the body. and. Then it brought about the whole idea of assuming that these entities invaded the body and caused infections. Now, some of the sources we've got are Dr. John Tilden, Dr. Beto Bailey and Dr. Leveson. All of them are medical doctors or were. They're all kind of around the end of the 19th century. Some of them lived into the 20th century, but they were fairly close contemporaries of Pasteur and they looked into what was going on and they were not at all convinced by the information that Pasteur was putting out and some of his papers and there's even some, I believe his name is Geisen, who's written a book showing that some of Louis Pasteur's work was in fact nowhere near as methodical as it's made out to be. So Louis Pasteur's held up as this hero of modern medicine as a germ theory and a lot of his contemporaries were saying no but of course it didn't suit the people of the time or the people who were running the medical system of the time to have that theory questioned at all. If I could just mention here, sorry to interrupt, all, yeah. uh, just to mention that in case people don't realise that Louis Pasteur was not a doctor, he was a chemist and in later years, after his death, he'd left notes to say that none of his papers or research work were to be made public, which is an interesting fact in itself as to why someone would want to do that. And many people who have sort of looked into his work have classed him actually as a fraud and may talk a little later about some of this stuff, particularly his association with rabies and a rabies vaccine. So we could talk about that a bit later, but anyway. Hand it back to Dawn. Yes, I was just quoting a few examples, but the ones we've included in the book are just a few. I mean, it takes a lot of effort and the way the internet's going and the way that information is being closed down and becoming more difficult to access. It does take quite a bit of digging into some of the older papers and some of the older writings of people of the late 19th century, early 20th century. But one of Dr. Tilden's comments, I think we've got it at the head of that particular chapter about the germ theory, where he says that germs as a cause of disease is a dying fallacy. He actually called it a fallacy. Now, Dr. Tilden died in about 1940. So we're talking the best part of 100 years ago. The idea that germs were the cause of disease was just not accepted, but it's been pushed and pushed and pushed. There are reasons for it, which I'm sure we'll go into in more detail later on, but some of it is because it's a very useful something to use to frighten people, but it also distracts. And, you know, you rightly say that the environment's getting more and more toxic and more and more people are aware of that. But of course, it's much easier to say, oh, well, it's all germs. It's nothing to do with pollution. There are more and more germs and they're all affecting us and they're all invading our bodies. And that's what causes disease. Well, that just simply isn't true. There are, of course, many examples that we discuss in the book of how the theory just doesn't follow the empirical evidence. You know, the experiences of real people in the real world 
don't match this theory and so it really starts to fall apart and it's quite obvious that it's useful but it isn't actually true. If I could just come in a little on that because going back to those early years when they sort of with optical microscopes this is in the time before the electron microscope was invented which didn't come in until around the 1930s but in those early years when they just had the optical microscopes and they first discovered bacteria which are living organisms because they saw them if they found either diseased or dying flesh then they assumed because they saw bacteria around those damaged areas damaged tissues then they assumed that it was bacteria that had caused it and as we've seen and i think it's quite a nice sort of anecdote is to say that would be the same as accusing firemen of starting fires just because whenever you see a house fire there are always firemen around it and this was the most fundamental mistake that they made with bacteria they assumed because they saw them around dead and diseased tissue that they were the cause as proper research has shown they are actually cleanup agents and should be thought of as that so all the normal if we think of bacteria and fungi the various sorts they're always breaking dead tissue down without them i mean you see that in, in woodlands you see it in many aspects of life that bacteria and fungi which instead of being blamed for causing disease are actually essential to the body in fact it's been estimated that in the human gut there's something like a pound and a half of bacteria <laughs> you know there are millions and millions of them and without them your digestion system wouldn't work and without them well life would not survive on earth so they're actually essential not a hindrance so completely given the the wrong sort of stigma to them but as dawn said earlier as time went on it became convenient to blame them bacteria because then sort of lotions and potions could be prepared to kill off this bacteria no doubt we'll talk about antibiotics a little later too many of the diseases that they were then attributing to being caused by bacteria but bear in mind as we'll talk more of none of it was ever proved it was just assumptions but they realized that there were certain illnesses diseases that they couldn't pin on bacteria so they thought there must be something else but they didn't know what it was and then in the 1930s when the electron microscope was discovered which gave them the ability to see smaller things they were able to see tiny particles in the blood which they gave the name viruses to even though as we say in the book the virus the word virus is a very old word i think from the latin which just means poison but it's been a corrupted term now to talk as if these tiny particles are actually living things like bacteria but in actual fact science shows us i mean true science shows us that they're not living things they're basically tiny bits of protein which are not alive at all they don't meet any of the criteria this is not our idea this is held by science they don't meet any of the criteria for something to be alive which means it should be able to eat and excrete and have a certain minimum dna and to reproduce these are the things that define whether something is alive and these particles that they call viruses don't have any of those attributes so basically <laughs> they're a non-living thing right sorry i just wanted to jump in and say that i did have this written down because it is such a curious thing. I think a lot of people have this attitude of trusting the experts. They've got this on lock. They've been studying these things for a long time. From your book, you have this thing where you say, in August of 2008, Scientific American ran an article entitled, Are Viruses Alive? And to quote that article, they say, first they were seen as poisons, then as life forms, then as biological chemicals. Viruses today are thought of to be in a gray area between living and non-living. And it's like, what? That basically says nothing. Exactly. So uh, kind of backs up what you're saying is like, they don't really even know what a virus is. Exactly. <laughs> well, it suits their purpose for them to say that viruses are alive, but they have never been living organisms. And we quote biologist Lynn Margulis saying that you know, as a biologist, not a virologist, saying that they are non-living and that bacteria are 
the origin of all life because bacteria are so predominant, well, everywhere, and uh, they're ubiquitous. So they are one of the fundamental particles of life. And as such, it raises huge questions about how they can actually cause illness. But at the same time, viruses are convenient for those diseases that they want to say, oh, aren't caused by bacteria. So they bring in the whole virus thing, which, of course, probably takes us on to what's going on at the moment with the whole coronavirus. There's an awful lot of misinformation being put out about that. Yeah, I think probably just because this virus thing is a really big issue, as Dawn said, you know, and it's very convenient to blame a virus for almost anything. And the medical establishment, (laughs) I will say, inventing new viruses all the time, you know. But there was an interesting case, and this is only a few years ago, and this was in Germany, uh, Dr. Stefan Lanker, and people might want to look him up. It's only a few years ago. He is a doctor. He's also a virologist, although he now states that he doesn't want to be called a virologist. He's obviously still a doctor. He doesn't want to be called a virologist because it's, a, as he puts it, it's a bankrupt science. It's just not a science at all. And he's quite disgusted with it all. In fact, he's on the record as saying neither he nor his team have ever found any virus to be the cause of any disease. Now, that's a bold statement coming from a doctor and <laughs> a virologist at that. In mm-hmm. fact, one of the most famous things we have seen about Dr. Stefan Lanker is, and this again is only a few years ago, to prove his point, he put out a challenge to ask anyone to prove that a virus was the cause of measles. Okay, And he offered money for this, you know, if anyone could do it. Well, obviously, the pharmaceutical companies wanted to push a man forward to take that up, and they took it into court. Cut a long story short, they were unable to prove in court that any of the scientific papers they could bring forward, none of them proved that a virus caused measles, and Dr. Stefan Lanker won his case. Now, you may find that that's surprising, that you'd have thought that would have been headline news all around the world. You know, there isn't a virus that causes measles. Therefore, it begs the question, well, what are vaccinations for? What is the measles vaccination for that they're pushing all the time and frightening mothers to get their young children vaccinated against measles because it's a terrible thing and could even cause death? And yet a court case in Germany in recent years, only two or three years ago, was able to show that there is no virus that causes measles at all. So that just shows you the, yeah, I'll call it corruption, the corruption that's going on in the medical establishment and the authorities generally, and also the complicity of the world media in propagating this deception rather than doing their job properly, which is to expose these sorts of things to the public to to show just what a nonsense it is. And that's just that one virus. But as I say, Dr. Stefan Lanker said he's never found, he or his team, so there's not just him involved, have never found any virus to cause any disease. So we have to ask ourselves, what is it that's going off, particularly with this huge scaremongering that's going worldwide with the coronavirus, which we'll come back to now. Well, I, I was actually going to go back to the point with the measles because soon after the court case, It was actually very interesting and possibly, well, it wasn't particularly surprising for us, but there was a great deal of media attention on measles cases and really hyping up the apparent danger of measles. Now, measles is always considered to be, or, you know, up until very recently, always considered to be something of a mild disease and that children generally kind of got over it and the only problems were called complications and complications weren't actually necessarily as a result of the measles such the complications were to do with other factors but of course the media don't necessarily report all of that but they were certainly happy to report lots of measles cases and all these different children and the reason that there were more measles cases is because parents weren't taking their children to be vaccinated so you know these points are all connected together but it was quite a an increase in media reporting about measles and measles cases. Soon after that case 
was decided in Dr. Lanker's favour. So, yeah, it's funny how these things work, but not too surprising that it just erupted in that way. Well, let me ask you this real quick, because, and we can talk about it in the context of coronavirus if we want, but just the idea of being contagious, whether it's measles or chicken pox or the common cold. It feels like we've all experienced getting sick after our friends and family have gotten sick and just from being around them. Is that not right? Because that's kind of the thing that makes me think, well, clearly they have something in them or on them. And then it got to me. What about contagiousness? Is is this not a phenomenon? (laughs) It's an interesting question and one that obviously we looked at very carefully. But Bearing in mind what we've just been saying, that there is no proof that either a bacteria or a virus can cause any disease, okay, and we can give more evidence for that, you start to question exactly what you've said. Well, you know, how does it, if someone in an office environment, you know, someone's got a cold, and then people start going down with this cold conditions, and obviously they all blame one another for coughing germs over one another. So it's a common experience. But there are many factors to be involved in that sort of phenomena, again, which we explain in the book. Because we are quite categoric at saying, well, we're not denying that people get ill. We're not denying that groups of people can get ill. But because we know that it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, then there is some other cause. Of course there is. So these are the things that we started to look at. And it brings in things like environment the environment that people are working in, which can be the polluted air, it can be food and drink, it can be, as we know, electromagnetic radiation, which is an increasing thing, particularly with the advent of 5G, which many people are extremely worried about. So all of these things within a group can affect that group. And of course, (laughs) depending on the health of their bodies, depends what they eat and drink. So there can be many factors. We discuss, as we found over the 10 years that we've been studying this, that we've broken it down to four factors, which we discuss in the book, which are the root cause of all illness and the mechanism that they work through. And we can talk about this later, which is the production of free radicals in the body, which is a normal process. We'll talk a little bit about it now, since I mentioned it. All of these things that make people ill is when you get an overproduction of free radicals in the body, which are not mopped up through the use of antioxidants. Okay, now it's a natural process for the body to produce free radicals during normal living activity. But if a person is eating correctly and has got the right intake of nutrients which contain antioxidants, then the body just mops those up and they're excreted in the normal way. Also during sleep. The body's natural healing process, again, whilst you're asleep, goes through a process of mopping up these free radicals. But if there are things that disturb that, and this can happen with night shift workers who sleep in the wrong part of the day, as far as the body's concerned, or people that are not having a proper nutritious diet, they don't contain enough antioxidants in their diet, then they get this buildup of free radicals which damage tissue. And this is a fact. And if you've got enough of them for long enough, you can get very severe damage. So it can go from just a light illness or a fever to literally cancer, which is what cancer is. It's long-term damage to tissue. But the body can heal from that. That can be corrected if it's caught soon enough. Hence the little story that I mentioned earlier with the relative who did refuse everything and Basically, if you like, cured yourself of cancer without doing anything special other than living normally. The other thing with the whole idea of contagiousness is the fact that people are attributing their different symptoms to being indications of different diseases. So if you've got X, Y, Z symptoms, then it's this disease. If it's something slightly different, it's another disease. Interestingly, many of them have actually got very similar or rather many symptoms in common. I mean, fever, cough runny nose, maybe sort of digestive problems, you know, they're common to so many. And so we wonder, well, how come you've got all these different diseases? Why are there so many different diseases? But not only that, they seem to be increasing in number. And 
it's not easy to find out how many different diseases there are supposed to be, but it's hundreds, if not thousands. I just don't know. But they're making up different names and subdividing them into different categories all the time. But that's really another major problem that we found, which is another you know, big revelation, that there aren't different disease entities. There are different collections of symptoms and people have similar symptoms. So if there's something that's going around the office, as it were, people will have similar symptoms or they may have many similar symptoms, but they won't necessarily have exactly the same symptoms and for the same length of period or the same intensity. So they're not easily identifiable as exactly the same disease. Now, the reason that people have different symptoms, as David was saying, is because of different states of the body. Now, sometimes people have similar symptoms at the same time. So, for example, you know, children get together during the summer holidays and then when they go back to school, they seem to have lots of colds or something. Now, it's because of similar circumstances. It could be just, you know, going back to school. There are all sorts of possibilities of what caused those symptoms, but it's nothing to do with diseases. It's to do with what the symptoms actually represent, which are the body's normal processes of dealing with the toxins and just releasing them. So sneezing is expulsion of different irritants that have gone into the respiratory system. Obviously, you know, diarrhea, vomiting are problems in the digestive system. So these are natural processes and the body's far more capable of dealing with them because it's got its own natural mechanisms for healing itself. And this is, again, another quite important point, that the body is not given anywhere near as much credit for the ability to actually look after itself, heal itself, and become and remain healthy. In but fact, it needs to be given the right circumstances. Yeah. Again, our research has shown that only the body can heal itself, providing, as Dawn has just said, providing you have a healthy diet as much as you can and a healthy lifestyle as much as you can. And this doesn't mean that you have to be down the gym every few days. You don't have to go to the gym at all. <laughs> but you do need to be able to eat correctly. You do need to get the correct level of nutrients and vitamins through natural food, good food. In fact, there's a doctor, Dr. Henry Beeler, did write a book called Let Food Be Your Medicine, I think it was. And I think he's quite well known in sort of A-list people in Hollywood. I think Jane Fonda was a great believer in, I think they called it Beeler's Broth, which was a particular nutritious soup that she swore by, but I digress slightly. But basically we found it's only the body that can heal itself. Now, certain medicines, shall we say, whether it's herbs or whether it's something the pharmaceutical companies provide, may mask the symptoms, but they don't cure anything, and that's for sure. They don't cure anything. And there are so many, I know they call them side effects from pharmaceutical products, but we just call them effects. You know, that's what they are. They're effects of some of these medications, which are actually far worse than anything you had to start with. And very often lead to a chain reaction of you end up taking another medicine to actually ameliorate the first medicine that you took. And I've come across people which have got shelves full of medications which they're taking on a daily basis, which is really scary. Right. But of course, this is all great money for the pharmaceutical companies. Of course, of course. And uh, I'm totally with you with the idea that just the body can heal itself, that the drugs we're given from the medical system aren't doing a whole lot. As you say in the book, a lot of the symptoms of a toxin exposure are nausea, headache, vomiting. These are the exact same side effects of medication. So it's like, well, are these just toxins? And uh, I guess I'm still on the contagion thing. I hear a lot of your points, but let's look at something like maybe chicken pox, because there is a visual component to chicken pox. You know, it's hard to quantify someone's cough or someone getting the chills. But when you see little red dots on a person, that's pretty easy to quantify. And then you take those kids because they're apparently contagious and you have them interact with each other so they get the virus. I mean, this is just the conventional 101 chicken pox stuff. 
But because we can see that one and, and it jumps from person to person or so it seems, what's really going on there? If we have kid A with red dots on him, they say he has chicken pox, he interacts with kid B, and next week kid B has those dots and, and has some similar symptoms. What's that about? That's a very good point. And um, first of all, let me explain when someone has had a, a certain level of toxic intake, shall we say. The body is trying to get rid of that as it recognizes it as a poison. And as Dawn had said earlier, that can come out being sick or diarrhea, catarrh, because the body is employing the mucous membranes, various ways that it has for getting rid of those toxins. But one of the main reasons and one of the main processes that it uses is the skin. It's the largest organ in the body. And the body will use the skin to expel various toxins through the skin. And this is, of course, where you get either rashes or blisters appearing on the body. Okay. Now, for a group of children to seem to suffer these things all at the same time, you would have to look at, again, as we sort of alluded to earlier, what is in their environment? What is in their, the local things that are happening to them? Now, as we know, many children go through, right from a very early age, a process of vaccinations. Okay which are highly toxic. Again, we may talk about them a little later. So you can end up with a group of children who've all gone through a similar vaccination process because they all seem to get them the a certain rate of vaccines at the same age. Well, of course, the body is seeing those as toxins. They have some quite dreadful things in them, and it's going to get rid of them. So you can have a group of children all coming up with their bodies trying to expel this rubbish from them, and it's coming out through the skin. And it's coming in, you get the blisters. The doctors call it chicken pox. But these sorts of blisters appear for all sorts of different reasons. And the doctors often put all sorts of different uh, diagnoses on them. But it's basically all stems from the same problem of the body is just trying to get rid of the toxin as quickly as it can. And it'll employ all its systems so the children can feel really bad. They can have headaches, they can have vomiting, they can have diarrhea, and they can also have the blisters coming up on the skin because the body is employing all of its systems to get rid of the toxin as quick as it can. And the reason you get a group of them is because they've all experienced um, the same intake, shall we say, of whatever the toxin is. And I'm just suggesting, because we've seen it happen, that one of these reasons that you get a group of children all experiencing the same thing at the same time is because they've just gone through a probably a very similar intake of vaccinations. I would also say that even though it happens in many cases, there are exceptions. There are, although possibly less so, I, I don't know, I don't know the exact statistics, but even, as you say, sort of, you know, child A has spots and blisters placed with child B. Child B might not always get the same skin eruptions or whatever you can get. It doesn't always happen. It's not an inevitable. It's seen as, oh, well, you know, my child had it, so, you know, your child is going to get it. It's not always the case. But that also brings in another aspect of the idea about contagiousness, is that it's sort of tied in with belief systems as well because when people really believe that that's what's going to happen quite often they can get it's not quite psychosomatic but there are real symptoms that can develop as a result of believing that something like a virus or whatever is going to cause a disease you know, in recent years, many people have said, oh, you know, keep away from me. I've got the lurgy. And I said, don't worry, you've got nothing I can catch. And I absolutely know it. But it's just common for people to say, oh, you know, you don't get near me because people believe germs are spread between people. It really is so ingrained. It's just not the case. If I could just come in on that a little more, Bill mentioned the placebo effect. Now, this effect is very well known in the medical establishment, and it is so powerful that when they are doing drug trials, they have a placebo pill, you know, which is, want of a better word, just a sugar pill, to test against whatever the drug is that they've just manufactured. 
okay? But of course, when they do a, what they call a double blind, so they have two groups, one group they're going to give the new drug to, and the other group will get a placebo pill. But of course, they're not told that that's what it is. They both think they're getting the same drug. And they can get surprisingly the same results from both group A and B, even though one's had a drug and the other's had a placebo pill, sugar pill, which they thought was the drug. So the placebo effect is very, very powerful and is used to great extent by the medical establishment today. They will give it to people and tell them, yes, okay, you've come into the surgery and you believe you've got this, that and the other and here's this particular drug that people think they're going to get and doctors will administer a placebo pill. But of course, the patient doesn't know that. And they'll go away quite happy and believe that, you know, as they often do, say, come back and see me in a couple of weeks if all is not well. Well, of course, by that time, all is well, so they never see the patient again. So we shouldn't underestimate the placebo effect. And as Dawn said, this is the belief in something that is going to happen. And this plays a great part in people becoming ill because they think they've just been sneezed upon. I mean, and using that example... It's not that many years ago when some experiments were done by the medical establishment using groups of men who'd got, I think it was influenza, and they were bringing in healthy men to sit in front of them whilst the sick person then coughed in their face. I know it sounds disgusting, but this was the experiment that they conducted to see if they could pass the flu germ through, we're only talking sitting a couple of feet away, by coughing straight in the face of the healthy person. And they did this numerous times, and not one not one of the healthy people caught the flu. So that starts to tell you, there's, again, it's another one of these holes that appears in the idea that you can pass germs through the air to another person in close proximity and give them your flu. <laughs> and there are many cases like this. Just because this is a particularly interesting one, it shows one of the holes in the medical establishment's theories, is in the late 19th century, Dr. Robert Koch, who some people may have heard of, and the medical establishment still used today what are called the Koch postulates. Okay, Now, one of what I think is the most telling of his postulates is that he said that any sick person you should always be able to find the germ in that person that has caused the disease. So whatever it is, let's say it was diphtheria or tuberculosis or something like that, that a person that is sick with it, you should always be able to find the germ in their system that has caused it. Okay, and that sounds pretty sound reasoning. And yet there are many, many, many instances where that is proved not to be true. Someone, let's say, has got tuberculosis but they don't have the, I think it's the tubercular bacteria in their body. And also the same thing where they've done tests with people with diphtheria, and yet they've not got the bacteria in their body. So again, that blows big holes in the medical establishment's theory that, you know, the germs cause the disease when people can have the disease, but not have the germ in their body. And you've actually got the converse of that as well. So It's just more and more of this evidence that just shows their theories are just that. They are totally unproven and totally unscientific. Yes, I think those are great responses. And in particular, the placebo effect. We think of it in the context of healing, but it could also work on the flip side of getting sick if you think you're going to get sick. Absolutely. And man, time is really flying by here. There was something I wanted to get into in the first hour, you know, before we eclipse that. And that is plagues, because we have this history that involves outbreaks like the Black Plague or smallpox, even using it to kill the Native Americans, they talk about, or malaria, which we're told comes from mosquito bites. So in the book, you talk about the fact that there have been three major plague outbreaks in history, the plague of Athens in the 5th century, the plague of Justinian in the 6th, and the Black Death in the 14th century, which was said to have killed 50 million people worldwide. You write in the book, Fortunately, when it comes to the Black Death, several contemporary eyewitness accounts have survived that enable us to have a better understanding of the prevailing conditions, which in turn 
offer a better explanation than that of an infectious bacterial disease. This was so fascinating. There's a couple elements here, but can you elaborate on the conventional story and what these eyewitness accounts tell us? Something happened. Yeah, sure. The Black Death is a particularly good one because it was always told as a frightening story to everyone. And we were always told it was all to do with the fleas on rats transmitting a bacteria to people, which then gave them this horrible disease, which for the most part people died of. And this was believed and propagated by the medical establishment and the authorities generally right up to very recently, up until a few years ago, where various researchers, other than us, were looking into it and realized that they didn't hold up. You know, the <laughs> rat fleas uh, transmitting this bacteria, that the whole thing was just a fallacy. Okay, so then the next question is, well, okay, well, people were certainly getting ill and dying, so what was it? And a guy, Mike Bailey, who actually is a dendrochronologist, uh, he's studying tree rings of all things, but because of his research, uh, I think he was at a Irish university, because of his research, he could find out what the atmosphere was at various times in history. And cutting a very long story short, but if you can get hold of it, it's a very good book to read called New Light on the Black Death by Mike Bailey. I would recommend it because it's very enlightening, but it's quite conclusively shows that during the period of the Black Death, the Earth's atmosphere was highly polluted, poisonously so. And from the various elements that appeared in the atmosphere, these appear in the tree rings, which Mike Bailey was able to analyze and show what the levels of pollution were and why it was so poisonous. And it was this was the sort of thing that people were dying of over such wide areas and so quickly. And there's also eyewitness accounts of, you know, the seas boiling and Lots of fish coming to the surface that were coming to the surface dead. Well, they're certainly not going to have been affected by rat fleas, you know. So <laughs> it's quite obvious there was something else happening. And the evidence definitely points to a poisoned atmosphere, which seems to have been caused, again, the records support this, by comet debris entering the Earth's atmosphere and poisoning it. That's the short story which then fits in with all of these other strange experiences of people seeing sort of very dark and stinking atmospheres and dropping down dead. As I say, rivers and lakes becoming polluted and killing all the fish. And this has much more credence, again with Mike Bailey's work, of a worldwide or certainly widespread around the world poisoned atmosphere rather than anything to do with fleas on rats. So, uh, <laughs> again, a very interesting <laughs> subject. Indeed. In fact, his book is called New Light on the Black Death, The Cosmic Connection. And the quote you have in your book is that he, he kind of says, you know, look, there really isn't enough information about comets and earthquakes and ammonium to be conclusive, but it is quite a serious suggestion that the Black Death was due to an impact by comet debris on January 25th, 1348. And I just think that's really interesting. You talk about ice cores and, of course, his tree rings backing this up, that there was some environmental issue that was much bigger than an invisible virus. And to go back to the rats then, you talk about anthropologist Barney Sloan, and he says excavations in the city of London have turned up very little evidence of a mass rat die-off coinciding with the plague. So the story we have, the evidence for it isn't there, yet we do have this other collection of evidence that is not in the official story that seems to be uh, a giant contributor. But I guess the, the, the question that I would still have is, okay, so a comet came in, a meteor came in. I've heard people talk about those containing viruses. What, what kind of poisons do you think that would contain that would cause this kind of situation, if not a virus or some kind of foreign bacteria. We also have the thing about people traveling internationally, the conquistadors, the colonialists bringing over diseases the Native Americans weren't ready for. And that could be a cover story because it's like, hey, we didn't want to kill them all. They just got sick. I don't know what to do. But I, what are your thoughts on some of these things? 
Yeah, so. that is certainly the cover story because, again, referring to another extremely important book called American Holocaust by Dr. David Stannard, he has undertaken quite a lot of research and put together an extremely important book showing how a lot of contemporary evidence about what happened when the conquistadors arrived on the shores. Obviously, you've got to be careful now because you're an American. <laughs> um, but really what happened was pretty brutal. And it's possibly a good idea to say, oh, well, it, you know, they just brought their diseases because then it kind of diverts attention away from some of the more horrific aspects of what happened because the invaders wanted the gold and they pushed people off their land so people weren't able to grow their own food anymore. And they were pushed into gold mines, and that's particularly, well, that's known to be particularly horrendous plantations. They were slaves on plantations. So all these horrendous acts are sort of put to one side because they say, oh, well, no, it was smallpox. Now, we do talk about smallpox quite a bit in the book because it's the first disease for which vaccines were developed. And again, that's down to a chemist, Edward Jenner, rather than a doctor. And the whole idea that smallpox was caused by some kind of germ, although at the time it wasn't part of the germ theory, but the idea that smallpox could be prevented by vaccines. But it was the first disease that was thought to be contagious. Well, let me just come in on this, because Dool mentioned earlier the book about the American Holocaust for the whole of the Americas, you know, although it happened at different times in the South America when the conquistadors moved in, but something very similar happened then in North America when the British moved in. But in both cases, particularly in South America with the conquistadors, that occupation was particularly brutal. And Dr. Stannard goes into it in quite revealing detail and it's quite hard reading to see what went off what is based on his eyewitness accounts but yeah the people were slaughtered in large numbers chased off their land so the people were then dying of starvation so all of the normal so-called diseases come in represented with severe malnutrition but worse than that the conquistadors enslaved what people they could catch and because they were only there for the gold and silver and so they were forced into the mines as slave labor, where many of them died, because one of the things the conquistadors thought was seemed a good idea to them is there was lots of native people around, so they didn't need to bother feeding them. As the people died, they were just disposed of, and they brought more people in. Yeah, hard to believe, I know, but there is evidence to support this. So they were responsible for almost wiping out the entire population of South America and up through the islands surrounding it. And it was nothing to do with them bringing their diseases over. But it's much easier to talk about, oh, yeah, well, the conquistadors came across, you know, they didn't know they'd got these diseases and, you know, the local population didn't have any immunity and, and they died off, you know, most regrettable, but not really our fault sort of thing, really, rather than facing the brutal facts of what they actually did to the local inhabitants, which was horrific. I mean, these people, these conquistadors, who sort of, came up against the local inhabitants. I mean, they had things like armoured dogs, which were trained to literally chase people down and rip them apart. And they they used these to hunt down the local populace. I mean, I won't go on to, into this in too much detail, but I do. if anyone wants to know what a real Holocaust is about, then have a read of what happened in South America, the true story, which is, as I say, nothing to do with smallpox or any other disease. It's to do with pure brutality and wholesale slaughter of people and mass starvation. And those were the real killers of what happened in South America. And something very similar happened in North America too with the North American natives. Well, that definitely makes sense to me. I think that's a really great breakdown. And we, we do have this long history of we're told diseases and viruses. So the conversation can quickly turn into, well, how do we explain this situation? How do we explain that situation? And there does have to be some answer. And clearly, I, th I feel like your book lays out some really great alternatives for every case. And I did want to, as we're still in that first hour, try to throw in something about coronavirus. I mean, before when we talked about the Black Death, it's like, yeah, a comet or meteor came in, 
The skies and waters were very clearly contaminated. This is a big thing you can still find in tree rings today, apparently. So obviously that was a giant environmental thing. Maybe they didn't know what was going on at that time depth. But coronavirus today, people are seemingly getting sick. I'm totally on board with the idea that the media is blowing this up a lot bigger than maybe it it needs to be. But how do we explain what's happening to people in this situation? Okay. Well, again, we need to just cast our minds back as to where we started with this conversation about how we are told by the establishment and propagated by the media various stories about things, as we mentioned earlier, whether it's 9-11 or JFK's assassination or even the start of the Vietnam War. We're told things that then subsequently turn out not to be true. And we've had these various virus scares before, whether it's SARS or Ebola or even HIV. And we talk quite a bit about HIV AIDS and how that's proved not to be. I mean, in the 80s, I'm old enough to know when this all first started. And we were told this was going to be a scourge of the earth and millions and millions of people are going to die and things will never be the same again. Well, obviously, that never transpired. And we can talk more about HIV and AIDS because that's another fallacy that's been put out. What the true causes of that disease is, we can talk about later if we have time. So we're, we're told a lot of information which subsequently proves not to be true. And I firmly believe, and I think many people are latching onto it now, that this coronavirus thing is yet another one of those. And I think, and this is me speculating now slightly, that what we could be witnessing here is what people may know as a PSYOP. We know from all the things that we've just been talking about, it's certainly nothing to do with a virus. So we've got to ask ourselves, well, what is happening? But we have to also ask ourselves, is what's coming out through the media, and that's all we've got to go on, is it actually true? Are these numbers of people that are suddenly becoming ill, is it true? The numbers of people dying, is it true? If there are people dying, what are they really dying of? You know, there could be all sorts of things that we're not being told. And as we know, in China, they've not got the best records for containing their pollution. So we could have within that area, and it's all centered in Wuhan, isn't it? One area. We might have to look at what the industry is around there. What sort of factories and things are we witnessing an escape of certain pollutants, which has happened in the world before in different countries and killed thousands of people, thinking of one in India, Bhopal. the Bhopal incident. So and I think that was eventually shown to be Union Carbide with an escape of some of its noxious materials, which wiped out thousands. And we could be looking at something similar to that. But as some very wisely said, it's much easier to blame a virus because you can't sue a virus but you can sue a chemical company, and it could be as simple as that. So people need to be very careful about accepting information given out by the authorities. So that's one thing. And the other is, as we know, and I'm sure many of your listeners are quite aware of various globalist agendas, shall we say, for world control. And we could be looking at a social experiment here of seeing how they can lock down a country, in fact, lock down the world if they get their way, and scaremonger people into believing something, again, blaming a virus, which we've talked about, and see just how far they can go with it. And on the back of this, as many people are already fearing, they're racing to produce a vaccine for this coronavirus. And what's the betting? They're then going to try and make it compulsory, and so bring in compulsory vaccination not only just in a country, but, you know, their extreme dream come true. They can bring it in to have compulsory vaccination worldwide. I mean, that's certainly a dream of the uh, vaccine makers. And we could be witnessing something like that. I mean, you've only got to look at some of the things that have gone off with the coronavirus. I mean, it's been made law in China that everyone has to wear one of these masks, which you see everyone wearing. And yet, even doctors in this country have admitted that because they believe in viral infections that, you know, remember, viruses are so small, tiny, tiny, tiny things you can only see with an electron microscope. So these masks would be, if it was a viral infection, would be of no use whatsoever. The virus would pass straight through it and infect the person if that were the case. And yet here we have a country now basically under martial law and everyone has to wear a mask, even though 
our own scientists and that know that that would do no good whatsoever. So it just shows the nonsense that's being talked and put out. So I think we have to be very, very careful in believing what the media tell us, remembering that the media are just mouthpieces. They don't have any technical ability of their own. They certainly don't do any proper research. They just do what they're told. They're given a script, they announce it to the public, and that's as far as it goes. There are suggestions and some reports as well that the coronavirus may be a bioweapon and we need to stop that one in its tracks as well because obviously a virus being a non-living particle cannot be made into something that... A um, weapon. <laughs> well, some kind of weapon, yes, it cannot be weaponized. That doesn't mean that certain particles cannot be poisoned with chemicals and turned into something that's then aerosol spraying into the atmosphere that is something that's extremely toxic that people can't become ill with. Now, the first cases of coronavirus, and I think most of them are cases that, that affect their respiratory system, and I think I read the first 99 cases were people who also had, or people who had pneumonia. So if they've got pneumonia, then I don't know why they need to find some other kind of virus or claim to have some other kind of virus. But if something has affected their respiratory system, it, it's definitely something in the atmosphere, in the environment, that people are obviously breathing in that are that's something that's really badly affecting their lungs, their respiratory, and, and obviously the symptoms that come with it are all the sort of coughing, sneezing, fever, because the body's trying to expel these poisons. So if it is some kind of poison in the atmosphere, whether it's been intentionally put in there, whether the idea of a bioweapon is another aspect of a PSYOP, it's not possible to say, but these are all sorts of ideas and they could be being put out just to see how the public react, to see how far they can go with these ideas. And I know this is probably quite radical, but the point is that it's not anything to do with a virus that can be spread that's going to be the next pandemic, the next HIV AIDS disaster, the next Black Death disaster, the next 1918 flu disaster, because again, we can talk about that if you want to. But, you know, these are called massive pandemics and none of them are as we are told. So we don't know what it is they're trying to do, but just be very, very careful and people should try not to be fearful of a virus. Because it certainly isn't that. <laughs> Whatever else it might be, it's certainly not a virus. Right. Well, definitely a lot to unpack because this overall germ, bacteria, virus theory, it affects so many different areas. And as we're starting to wrap this thing up, I wanted to reiterate again the four factors that you have talked about in the book and earlier that would be the causes for us getting sick, bad nutrition, toxic exposure, electromagnetic radiation, and EMF exposure, and then stress. Those would be the four things that actually get people sick. And the solutions to keeping us healthy or in a healthy state would be basically to avoid these four factors. And we did mention Dr. Caroline Dean and her book, Death by Modern Medicine, earlier. She also has a book called The Magnesium Miracle. And to quote that, it is a comprehensive guide to one of the most essential but often overlooked minerals, magnesium, which guards against and helps to alleviate heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, diabetes, depression, arthritis, and asthma. And that's just interesting. I mean, sometimes eating right isn't as easy as it sounds. Can you elaborate as we're ending this thing on techniques to stay healthy or vitamins and minerals that you think are most crucial to staying in a healthy state? Again, the short answer is, yes, she's absolutely right. Magnesium, along with many other minerals and vitamins, are essential for the body. But we would disagree that you need any large amounts of it. The amount of magnesium a healthy body needs is very, very tiny and is easily assimilated from the plants that you eat. Okay. Now, we'd already mentioned earlier that we recommend a plant-based diet, vegan if you can do it. But we'd also recommend that you try as much as you can to get organically grown food. And the reason for this is that if the food that you get from your supermarket or wherever is not organic, the chances are it's been grown in ground 
which has had chemical fertilizers on it, which deplete the ground of natural minerals, particularly things like magnesium. So the plant in its growth has not been able to take in all of the nutrients that it would normally have. And so then it's unable to pass those on to the humans eating them. But if you are buying organic food, of course, those types of chemical fertilizers are not allowed in the soil and the soil has to pass certain tests to be healthy. So then the food that's grown in it is healthy and a person eating that food will have all the nutrients, vitamins and minerals that they need. They do not need to take any additional supplements. And in most cases, unfortunately, the supplements that people would buy from their local health shop, because they're artificially made, in most cases, they're not either not easily assimilated by the body or not assimilated at all. So you're sort of wasting your money, really. The best and most perfect way to get all the nutrients you need is to just have a healthy diet with plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables, which ideally are grown organically. And the less you cook them, the more nutrients they retain. And the rules to a healthy body are very simple, but they're also quite strict. You know, that's what you need to do. And any compromise on that will compromise your health. It's as simple as that. Fair, totally fair. And obviously we threw out some radical stuff today, some really bold claims. And you say in the book, prove us wrong. Investigate for yourself whether any virus has been conclusively proven to be the cause of any infectious disease. Any investigation of this nature should involve contact with the organizations that claim viruses to be the cause of disease to ask them the following questions. Is there an electron micrograph of the pure and fully characterized virus? What is the name of the primary specialist peer-reviewed paper in which the virus is illustrated and its full genetic information described? And what is the name of the primary publication that provides proof that a particular virus is the sole cause of a particular disease? Ask those questions and... I guess you guys are confident that the listeners would not get any conclusive answers. Absolutely. We've been asking that question of many doctors and people for some years now, and no one, and I repeat, no one has been able to produce that evidence. And as we mentioned earlier, Dr. Stefan Lanker asked the same question in a court of law in Germany only a few years ago, and no one could provide that proof. So there you have it. Hmm. Might be the biggest lie we've ever been told. Yeah, and he's certainly responsible for probably more deaths. I, I often remember a quote from Napoleon, you know, the French general, who is quoted as saying to one of his physicians that one day it will be seen that you physicians are responsible for more deaths than all us generals put together. And I think <laughs> very wise words. Ah, yes, very wise words indeed. And it does make me also think, about all the generals like Napoleon who traveled all over the world and didn't die of malaria or whatever, whatever. But Yes. You know. yes. <laughs> Man. And before we go, you guys have also written together before under the pseudonym NOR for Nature of Reality. And I don't know if you've moved on from there, but you do have a couple books out under that collective name. And I was a bit curious about your 2010 book, The Nature of Reality, Exploring the Mind-Body-Spirit Myth. You have chapters like The True Nature of Time that talks about how you can learn to manipulate it, insights into reincarnation and death, understanding dreams, and even a section called The Magical Approach to Living. And I know that's surely an entire interview on its own, but I wanted to at least let people know that was out there. And if you have any cliff notes or an elevator pitch for that book, are there any parts you think would interest people or does it tie into the things we talked about today in any interesting way? In a way, yes. I mean, congratulations to you, Greg, for your research. <laughs> but yes, that was some years ago. But yes, the Nature of Reality book is probably one of the first works that Dawn and I did because we were fascinated about, as I think most people are, what is life about? You know, is this some sort of biological accident that we're here? Is there a purpose to life? What happens to you when you die? Do the religions of the world have any truth in them? It's, you know, all pretty, <laughs> pretty important stuff, really. 
and that's really what that book's about so yes you're quite right it's a good <laughs> it's a good few hours talk all on its own but it covers many things including probably in some small way of what health is all about as well as what life is all about also it was part of the research in compiling that book that made us realize the power of beliefs and again referring to Bruce Lipton the biology of belief and how your beliefs actually can affect your health and your body so you know the message really is it's not to be fearful of viruses and bacteria they are not your enemies but yes yeah, certainly what you believe and, and what you think they're quite powerful and I guess if you're going to carry anything from the Nature of Reality book, it is just how powerful beliefs are and, you know, how empowering they can be and how good they can be, but also the sort of uh, negative beliefs, just how bad they can be, as you did actually mention yourself earlier on in this discussion. And we sort of show that quite a bit in that book. But it also talks about the true nature of reality, which, as we say, is far stranger than you could possibly imagine. So, yes, it's a small book, but uh, highly recommended, of course, to your uh, to your listeners. Very cool. Very cool. Well, are there any links or contact information to leave people with or anything about getting this book that we've talked about today that they should know? Well, it's as simply as going onto Amazon, either .com or .uk or any, any Amazons, really, wherever you are in the world. It's on their side. You can either just put in our names or you can just put in what really makes you ill and the book will come up. It's got a quite a distinctive cover with Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker, on the front. So <laughs> it's quite distinctive. It's available in Kindle versions as well as a paperback version. Yeah. Today. Yeah. People may want the electronic copy, which is, I have to say, quite a bit cheaper, but has the same information, of course. So people can get whichever is most convenient and most affordable to them. They can also look for our, our other books written under our pseudonym at the time, which was NOR, stands for the Nature of Reality. There are reasons for that that I won't go into now. But yeah, it's probably easy to look for that one under Exploding the Mind, Body, Spirit, Myth. That seems to bring it up more easier than going into just the Nature of Reality. So Exploding the Mind, Body, Spirit, Myth by NOR. Yeah, a good read. <laughs> right on, right on. So, yeah, this has been a, a real pleasure. Are there any plans to work on future books together or any topics you're going to turn your attention to next? Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. We've, we've got a few we've, ideas. <laughs> we've, we've probably got about four books planned <laughs> that we're working on. Well, outlines, yeah. But yeah, only outlines. That, but we're wanting to deal more with geopolitics and the world banking system, which is responsible for a, a lot of problems. So I know people have written various bits about it, but we're trying to pull all of the stuff together in one book that will explain to people just what's going off, how the world is really run, who are the power players, and hopefully what we can do about it to protect ourselves from their extravagances. Another one is possibly involving the real problems with the environment and how the environmental movement has been completely hijacked by this whole global warming stroke, climate change stroke, climate agenda, whatever it is, it's diverting attention away from the real problems that are going on in the environment. As you said quite early on, there are lots and lots of problems within the environment and they're not being addressed. And they're certainly not being addressed by carbon taxes, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, all good stuff. I look forward to the next book. Let me know when it comes out. We'll definitely have to speak again in the future. And my mind is thoroughly blown. Lots of really interesting info and research talked about today. I very much appreciate the work you've done. I think we should be questioning everything we think we know. And today we definitely did that. So thanks again and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And all the best. Well, oh my, my, higher side shatters. We are poking the bear today. Bold show. Very bold show. But we like it bold, right? Big thanks to Don and David for their very interesting work. Having read the book, it is really impressive. I do appreciate that boldness, their whole prove me wrong challenge. But the truth is that two hours is just not enough time to make this case. It's so foundational to our thinking. 
It really covers the scope of the entire medical field, and that's probably too big for any single conversation. I don't know exactly where I stand. On one hand, you must be skeptical of the medical system because of everything it's done to discredit natural cures and nutrition-based health. Nutrition is a much bigger deal than the way it's presented, at least in this country. And petrochemicals are just a side hustle of the oil-everything Rockefeller elite. It's definitely not giving you the best unbiased care, and that's a huge problem. We know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. I also agree that the field itself isn't that advanced. It wasn't long ago their best efforts would be considered barbaric even to the most conventional of thinkers. The history of medicine is full of dark quackery, lobotomies, bloodletting, rudimentary surgeries with no anesthesia. Even something like circumcision is based on this fallacy that children don't feel pain. Like, there are some stupid ideas that are considered normal in academia. Things that are pretty counterintuitive. And we know the history of several vaccines, including the original polio vaccine, is pretty dark as well. And polio is another one of those diseases that people think was eradicated by other means, more so than the vaccine that gets all the credit. We know about SV40, and that's another thing. What do they think of SV40? Did the simian virus in the polio vaccine cause cancer? Ed Haslam thinks so, and I've been a big fan of his book, Dr. Mary's Monkey, and that whole research thread. And it's also true that, like they say, there's plenty of good, useful, necessary bacteria. But is all bacteria positive and helpful? I'm not so sure. What is salmonella? Isn't that bacteria? Is there really no disease or virus that can make us sick? Is contagiousness not a thing? I don't think I'm there yet. But it's useful to talk about this sort of stuff in the wake of a major virus scare. Because I fully agree that you should be less scared, not more. And the guests are right, that there are major PSYOP elements, major media hype elements, and a ton of disinformation. But on the other hand, it does seem like people are getting sick. Are these all supposed to be actors? Granted, I do only see this through screens. But if I had to guess, this coronavirus thing is the release of a bioweapon, either on accident or on purpose. I'm not sure to which degree our guests would consider something like a bioweapon possible. That might be how they define vaccines, but even if all bacteria is naturally beneficial, can it be altered in a lab? Like I said, still so many questions. I had one friend of mine mention that in Chinese government labs, the scientists commonly sell their animals after testing. Could they have injected an animal with something, and then it was sold at that market, and then consumed? Seems possible. It's good to be really cautious when you're talking about such a serious subject. I would never want to lead people astray, and I'm clearly not even smart enough to know how much validity to put in this kind of stuff. So you need to think for yourself. I'm just presenting you with an alternative that you probably wouldn't have heard anywhere else. And I want to make sure that we're not giving people bad information that they just run with. And I think our guests would agree with that, too. They did all this research, and because of that research, they are certain about this conclusion. And they also encourage all of you to do your own research, like any good guest should, who's confident in their position. So I don't know if they are exactly over the target with their conclusions, but they have a lot of great data, and I think they're much closer than anyone who's telling you to stock up on canned goods and water. And it is awfully curious how many conditions, like, say, autoimmune conditions, for example, when we do shows on certain nutrient solutions or iodine or red light therapy, the laundry list of conditions that these things help is so long that you have to wonder if maybe the way we define all these conditions is wrong. It's not 10 different autoimmune conditions. It's 10 different ways your body can react to a lack of X, Y, or Z. You see the distinction there? 
It's also curious how when you look at these major human die-offs in history, there is a reasonable alternative explanation or a lack of surviving evidence for the official story in several of these cases. We only got to talk about a few, but their book is full of them. And that is, I think, one of the best things about their book. So I'm intrigued and I would have this conversation again. I mean, Patrick Jordan is somebody we've talked to twice in the past who would probably be pretty aligned with Don and David. His whole thing is the serum sickness postulate that disease in the modern world starts with the vaccines, that it's all vaccine damage. From psoriasis to fibromyalgia to cancer to autism, don't inject kids with chemical cocktails and this won't happen. I think there's a case to be made that that's why people like Bill Gates and the CDC are so obsessed with getting their vaccines down into the depths of Africa. We have to obscure the data and make sure we infiltrate any natural control groups that people can look at. There's something real sketchy going on there. But like most things, my simple stoner mind thinks that the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. But the notion that illness comes from the four factors of bad nutrition, toxic exposure, EMF radiation, and stress, I think that's a great way to live even if those are the causes for 90% of it and not a full 100%. It's closer to the truth than a system that tries to say it's all random while shoving junk food, GMOs, geoengineering, corporate chemicals, rampant pollution, several dozen vaccines, and 5G down our throats and saying, well, we don't know why we have the rising rates of everything and why everyone's sick and we haven't cured anything in forever. But don't look at any of these things that we are responsible for and put the blame there. And we know how powerful the mind is. There's also something to that point about a reverse placebo effect. If a sugar pill is enough to make some people believe that they're healed, so is the right philosophy. So consider all this when you're inundated with coronavirus paranoia and do your own research. But if you liked hearing Don and David, do let them know. Do let me know. Do we want to hear more? Should we have them back to unpack this again? I would like to know. I expect this to be fairly divisive because it is so extreme. But of course, like every episode, we have a second hour for our precious, precious plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechats.com. Double your THC pleasure. Double your THC fun. In today's episode, we throw several more interesting logs on the fire. We get into the motivations, the reasons for the deception, the economics of it all, and the control mechanisms, and of course, Agenda 2030. We talk about travel vaccines and malaria, and they made an excellent point about having billions of dollars and all this energy poured into fighting malaria and tropical diseases through vaccines. But that same amount of money is not spent on just getting them clean water and clean, stable food sources. I think that's something we all agree would be a better use of that money. Instead of just letting them be the guinea pigs for these chemical cocktails that only benefit the private piggy banks of Big Pharma. But they also broke down the immune system fallacy, SRIs, psychiatric drugs, and the brain chemistry imbalance deception. There's no way to test brain chemistry, yet so many people are taking very serious drugs under the pretenses that theirs is off. We also talked about over-the-counter drugs and how risky they really are. So, all good, useful stuff. We learn more every day, and I think it's worth your time to get that second hour. But what do I know? That said, take care of you and yours. Pick up a copy of Don and David's great book, What Really Makes You Ill, if you want to go whole hog. And I'll see you next time. I've done my part. Your move, disease deceivers, friends of big pharma, and dark sorcerers of the modern medical system. Your fucking move. You know the plan has always been to hack your brain. MK Ultra's trying to drive you insane. They'll explode your heart if they think that's what it takes. You think I'm answering the phone? Well, I ain't. You gotta keep the curtains drawn. 
Cause you don't want anyone thinking you're at home Well, you're not You should tape the mail slot And baby, if I seem withdrawn Let me say it's cause I just don't wanna go and get whacked Maybe you should know that The trauma affects you like it does everyone It's just the game plan, it's what the world's become They'll suck out everything from you in the end And if for some reason you think I might be wrong I wonder where you got that opinion from You gotta keep the curtains strong Cause you don't want anyone thinking you're at home Well, you're not, you should tape the mail slot And baby, if I seem withdrawn, let me say Cause I just don't wanna go and get whacked Maybe you should know that The trauma affects you like it does everyone It's just the game plan, it's what the world's become They want a pat down and a swap Don't you see what's going on? Well now you know You're better keeping on your own Cause you can see the masters lie to trust yourself and if you think the system's out of touch it is and you can only trust yourself Maybe they aren't registering at all Now they know you're naive and vulnerable You won't believe all of the stunts that they'll pull Cause you can see the masters lie too much Oh baby, you can only trust yourself And if you think the system's out of touch It is and you can only trust yourself Cause you can see the masters lie too much Oh baby, you can only trust yourself And if you think the system's out of touch It is and you can only trust yourself 